um, it's my great pleasure um, to introduce um, Alex Barr, who um, I first met uh, when I was uh, a postdoc at UT Austin, um, where he had done his PhD with Mike Ryan. Um, he then uh, was a postdoctoral fellow here um, with uh, Ayla Howe um, uh, on a Humboldt uh, Foundation postdoctoral fellowship. Um, after which um, he became an assistant professor at Swarthmore College. I always get that uh, a bit mix, mixed up in my mouth. Um, hope I pronounced that well enough. Um, where he is now an associate professor running his own lab, looking um, at the mechanisms of um, behavior, uh, in particular um, endocrinology and, uh, and what goes on in the brain. So um, today he's talking about stress, uh, obviously a very important uh, topic for us in the cluster um, and one of the major, um, one of the major, but at least one of the larger uh, teams uh, in terms of a project. Um, and so uh, I'm really looking forward and I think we all are to hearing much more um, about whether sex is stressy or if stress is sexy. Oh, I've just been reminded, of course, uh, Alex, sorry to interrupt, um, that uh, Alex is um, on sabbatical here uh, with us um, in the cluster, um, working uh, with me, actually, luckily, um, but is available and very, very knowledgeable about all things um, hormonal. Um, and so if you do have any questions about hormone analysis um, in animals, in particular water, Born um, hormone stuff, um, but not exclusively. Um, Alex is here for a, a year, thereabouts. Um, obviously, with the lockdown, that's a little bit complicated, but he's always available um, on Zoom. So do reach out to him um, for all things methodological um, and endocrinological. Okay, over to you, mate. Great. Um, everyone can hear me okay. Thumbs up, Alex. Yep, yep. Thumbs up. Alex is all around. Great. Um, yeah, so thank you to the organizers, Carla, Alex Beald, and uh, special thanks to the Jordan Lab for welcoming me um, during the sabbatical year. Um, and thanks to everyone tuning in. I, uh, I realize it's Monday and it's your lunch hour and you're going to spend it staring at your screen listening to what I hope it becomes a deeply held passion, frog sex and frog stress, but um, I'll forgive you if it isn't yet. Um, as Alex Jordan mentioned, uh, please get in touch with me if you don't have a chance to ask a question or a follow-up. My email's down in the bottom left corner. Okay, what I want to do today is introduce what uh, unifies my research over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, so I'm going to start with the scope of research in my lab. Then I'm going to transition to giving you some background on endocrinology uh, that's really important to understand the work I'm going to share. And then I'll spend the majority of our time talking about two angles at which to ask the question about the relationship between sexual reproduction and the endocrine stress axis. And the first one will be to demonstrate to you that the act of sexually reproducing is quote unquote stressy. And the scare quotes here will become clear as we progress. But here what I want to tell you is that sex is energetically demanding. And Glucose is the currency in, in, the, uh, in the organism for meeting those energetic demands and glucocorticoids regulate glucose availability. So spoiler alert, sex is intimately related with glucocorticoids and I'll share with you what that really comes down to. And then I want to spend the plurality of time talking about some new experiments that ask whether or not experimentally manipulated glucocorticoid levels impact mate choice in female frogs. And so that's to ask the question, is stress sexy? And then we'll have some time for Q&A. So let me begin with uh, what we do in my lab. Um, I've got a variety of different projects ongoing, one of which has been a long-standing interest in individual variation and specifically how consistent different levels of phenotypic traits can be within an animal's lifetime. So this is one of the mechanisms of phenotypic plasticity and integration that unifies the work that I do. And I'm interested in behavior, neuroendocrine and endocrine levels. Um, and this is mostly done in songbirds. Another uh, thrust of the, uh, the work in my lab looks at the inverse of that coin. So instead of phenotypic consistency, we look at amphibian model systems whereby 
a day in the life of a, of a frog involves a major life history transition from breeding condition to post breeding condition. And that allows us a window to evaluate how the phenotype can be rapidly remodeled at multiple levels and how those changes can be integrated. Uh, another recent project, uh, collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania and Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada, examines female sexual signaling. So how females signal their sexual receptivity and preferences at levels including circuitry in the nervous system, neuroendocrine, and behavioral levels. And then lastly, and perhaps closest to my heart, is the question of how females choose their mates. And today, that's what I'm gonna focus my time on. And we're gonna examine that question at three levels behaviorally. How glucocorticoids change a female's proceptivity towards male signals. That's just a fancy word for sex drive or sexual motivation. How glucocorticoids may change females' preferences among conspecific males. And how glucocorticoids may change a female's choosiness, that is, how she expresses those preferences when there are trade-offs involved. These four areas of research have one thing in common, and it's this molecule right here, corticosterone. In amphibians and birds, this is the primary end product of the uh, so-called endocrine stress axis. Cortisol in humans and most other mammals, and as well as in fish. Um, I'll be referring to this as glucocorticoids, GCs, or cort throughout so that you understand what I'm talking about. This is a steroid hormone, um, and I'm going to go into some detail about this hormone. But before I do that, I want to start out introducing steroid hormones with one that's probably a bit more familiar. And this is testosterone. This is an androgenic hormone produced principally by the testes in male vertebrates. And I want to start with this because it uh, is probably familiar with many people in terms of the effects it has biologically. Testosterone's primary role is the production and maturation of sperm in the testes. That's why it's produced there. That's why it's in its highest concentrations there. And that's its primary function. But like all hormones, it has pleiotropic effects. And that landscape of pleiotropic effects is probably familiar to many of you. Androgens are anabolic hormones involved in growth. They modulate reproductive behavior like courtship and territoriality. They play an organizational role in the development of morphological characters such as secondary sexual characteristics. And then perhaps a little less familiar are their antagonistic pleiotropic effects, including down-regulating the immune uh, system and down regulating parental care. Okay, so there's really a diversity of actions here, all of which I want to point out are energetically demanding and necessarily involve trade offs. And that's what you're seeing in this antagonistic relationship. If you want to put more effort and energy into growth and courtship, it's going to have to be taken away from somewhere. There's no free lunch. And that's a common concept that we're going to return to in glucocorticoids. So what does the landscape look like for pleiotropy for glucocorticoids? This is probably less familiar for many of you. Um, populating this slide is something we're going to return to. But before we do that, I want to introduce this steroid in more detail. So endocrine systems um, are generally structured as cascading uh, axes of action. And the axis that controls glucocorticoids is known as the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or interrenal axis, depending on whether you're looking at a, a mammal, bird, frog, fish, reptile. In frogs, it's the interrenal glands. This axis begins in the hypothalamus. So basal brain secretes a hormone known as corticotropic releasing hormone or CRH, which binds to the anterior pituitary. And when it does so, it, the pituitary secretes adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH. This goes into the bloodstream, eventually finds its way to the adrenal glands, binds in the adrenal or interrenal cortices, and results in the secretion of the primary endocrine product of this axis, CORT. Under normal circumstances, CORT is relatively low in concentration in the blood. 
uh, and this is something we refer to as baseline. And baseline doesn't mean static. It's actually, uh, there's a rhythm here that's driven by a sequence of negative and positive feedback loops. But under low concentrations, that rhythm, that pulsatile pattern, is driven by court itself. Uh, and this is one of the features of endocrine systems. They're self-regulating. So court under low concentrations is going to bind to a very important receptor in the brain, in the hypothalamus, known as the mineralocorticoid receptor, or MR. This has a very high affinity for court, so it's going to bind it even under these low concentrations, and it's going to regulate a bunch of metabolic baseline functions. Under conditions of acute challenge, cord is going to increase in secretion, and there's going to be a lag of about three minutes before the onset of that induced elevation. And under that induced elevation of cord, there's going to be a rapid increase in cord, um, sometimes exponential. We refer to that as induced or GC reactivity. Those higher concentrations of cord are going to saturate the MR receptors, and they're going to start binding to the lower affinity GR or glucocorticoid receptor, also in the hypothalamus. And this is really important because this allows uh, the negative feedback angle to be engaged here that allows court to return back to baseline conditions uh, under which uh, we're primarily binding to the MR receptor. So that's a little bit of the temporal dynamics. Now the point that I want to make here is that the nature of the time course here is such that this endocrine axis is clearly very poorly suited to cope with the stressor at hand. This hormone is not going to help this frog, not in this moment. That's not what the HPA axis does, right? The timeline is simply not appropriate. So a few critical details about steroid hormones. These are lipophilic molecules. They have a core that is cholesterol with a bunch of different functional groups depending on the steroid. Because they're a cholesterol molecule, they diffuse across cell membranes, all cell membranes. Every single cell in the body has access to elevated hormone levels, but they don't have action in all cells. They only have biological activity in cells that express the proper cytosolic receptors. When they bind to those cytosolic receptors, uh, they often dimerize and then they're chaperoned into the nucleus where they act as transcription factors. All right, so these pleiotropic effects from a single hormone are really driven by three features. All you really need to have is variation in the distribution abundance of the two receptor types across different cell types and tissue types. That's gonna give rise to dose-dependent actions. Because they're expressed in really a, quite a variety of cells and because cells can regulate what the downstream targets are, you get a diverse uh, number of downstream gene targets. This is the genomic consequences of elevated steroid hormones. And these number in the thousands for glucocorticoids. And then lastly, the effects that we're interested in take on the order of minutes to hours to manifest because they're fundamentally transcriptional and genomic. So what does this landscape look like then for glucocorticoid hormonal pleiotropy? Well, it's all about energy. Right. The various effects that glucocorticoids have are united by the fact that they're metabolic. Glucocorticoid elevations are going to increase vascular reactivity. That's going to come at an energetic cost, and that needs to be made up for. And the way it's going to be made up for is denying glucose to other tissues, decreasing insulin production, decreasing glucose transport proteins in certain tissue types, uh, increasing lipid metabolism, catabolism, suppressing the immune system, and so on. So energy prioritization is really going to cash out as plasma glucose prioritization, and hence the name glucocorticoid. So what is happening here is glucocorticoids are prioritizing the availability of glucose uh, to certain tissues by denying it to others, and thereby increasing the absolute concentration in the blood. That fundamentally happens principally by decreasing the expression of glucose transport proteins in certain muscle tissues and adipose tissues, thereby freeing it up for other tissues. 
So we know glucocorticoids are important for a variety of different behaviors in vertebrates. We know they play a critical role in sleep-wake cycles, memory and attention, and uh, dietary appetite. But perhaps more than just uh, foraging and nutritional app appetite, perhaps also appetitive behavior more generally. And so one of the things we're going to look at today is appetite for sex. And that's something we refer to as proceptivity. Um, you can substitute sexual receptivity here. The point here is that we know that MR and GR receptors are in high abundance in areas of the brain that regulate sexual motivation, including the preoptic area and the ventral hypothalamus. We also know that the auditory midbrain that processes acoustic signals and integrates sensory and motor effects have relatively high concentrations of these receptors as well. It's therefore possible that changing the court environment could affect auditory selectivity and therefore conspecific preferences. And lastly, we know that MR and GR are distributed throughout pre, quite broadly and widely throughout the diencephalon and the telencephalon and limbic structures that we think are involved in decision making. So we'll also look at female choosiness. Okay, the, um, one of the core principles I want to hammer away at today is that glucocorticoids are not synonymous with stress. So hence the scare quotes here. Glucocorticoids are about preparing for energetic demands across different tissues in order to maximize fitness given real world constraints. So sex is stressy. Let me um, share with you um, where I'm coming from when I say that. And I'm gonna do that using our model system of tree frogs here. If we look at the energetics of sex in most in urine amphibians, we have males who are producing energetically demanding vocal signals during the breeding season in Lex. Um, and these vocal signals really uh, constitute the lion's share of aerobic energy use during the breeding season. In Tungara frogs, uh, which uh, I won't be talking about today, but we've got good data from them, we know that the vocal effort, which dominates the aerobic budget, um, roughly constitutes 3.3 kilojoules of total aerobic energy expenditure during a six month breeding season. So this is a frog calling thousands of times a night, every night for six months. And that uh, sums up the rules. But females are, are in a different situation. Females are not vocalizing. They're listening to males and they're making decisions, but most importantly, they're yoking up a clutch of energetically demanding eggs. And that egg pl clutch plus the cost of meat choice are going to be an order of magnitude higher in a breeding season for a female compared to her male counterpart. So females are in an energetically extreme position, right? Which we might expect to be associated with extreme glucocorticoid signaling and potentially interesting interplay there. So sex is energetically demanding, especially for females. And we know across a broad array of vertebrate taxa in all uh, classes that this is the case, that especially with baseline glucocorticoid levels, these tend to be at their annual peak during the breeding season. Right? We know that having high court is a life history partner with breeding. Even in humans where GCs are elevated during pregnancy, they surge immediately during labor, and they play a very important role in labor and delivery itself. So GCs are, are intimately related with breeding. Uh, up until recently, we knew this to be a seasonal phenomenon. We didn't know how close the temporal coupling was here. In the past few years, my lab has demonstrated in three different amphibian species that this is very tightly coupled. And we know that in the course of 24 hours, circulating glucocorticoids plummet after breeding. They're at a seasonal high on the day of breeding, and they're back down to basically regular annual levels 24 hours later. Okay, so um, reproductive events are going to be tightly linked with uh, divergent demands on various tissues for energy and glucose. So this is not too surprising. 
The second point I want to make about the sex is stressy point here is that that was all baseline GCs. If we look at GC reactivity or induced GCs, we know that they're also at a high when males are presented with uh, a receptive, a sexually receptive female. So this is to again point out that glucocorticoid elevations are not synonymous with stress. Right? Having the percept of a reproductive female is not something that uh, we think of as having a negative valence, quite the opposite. And in fact, if you compare the GC reactivity in a male rat when presented with a territorial intruder versus a receptive female, there's no daylight between those GC responses. They're really uh, extremely similar. So again, glucocorticoids are not about stress per se, they're about preparing for changes in how glucose becomes prioritized, especially in these important life history moments. And the size of the GC reactivity really matters. Okay, if we have a moderate increase in GC concentrations like the kind we have around 4 a.m. every day that prepare us for wakefulness, those are the kinds of changes you see. If, on the other hand, we have moderate elevations, such as those induced by calorie deficits, um, we see, for example, increases in foraging behavior. On the other hand, if that GC reactivity is really high, you have very high GCs in concentration in the plasma, this is more akin to that emergency life history moment. Right? This might mean the abandonment of offspring under inclement weather. It might mean uh, marshalling the glucose prioritization for breeding uh, and for mating. Okay, so this is really a system, this HPA, HPI axis, that is known for its hyperlability. This is, we often see orders of magnitude variation in circulating court. It does so many different things, and it achieves part of that diversity of action through its large dynamic range in concentrations. If we put court on the x-axis here and the behavior of interest, say locomotor behavior on the y-axis, we may find that the relationship between these things is an inverted U nonlinear dose response curve. Okay, and in fact, there's some evidence for that. It may be that at low concentrations, court has subthreshold level effects. At moderate concentrations, it has stimulatory effects. And at high concentrations, we begin to see suppression. There's some evidence for that. There's three published studies in, in animal model systems that support that. One from 1992, Diamond et al. showed that moderate court in the plasma uh, results in peak uh, population spike rates in hippocampal neurons. Another mouse study from 1977 showed that moderate uh, in injections of court result in the highest bursting of serotonergic neurons and serotonergic content, as well as the highest passive avoidance behavior. And likewise, uh, Bruner et al. showed in 1998 that moderate doses of court give rise to the highest level of perch hopping activity. So that makes sense. We know that, as I said earlier, quartz binding to different, these two different receptor types depending on its concentration. And those two different receptors have signaling pathways that differ. And therefore, it's no surprise that the end consequences at the phenotypic and behavioral level vary. And so I just want to highlight that uh, for a long time, we've been interested in whether court affects things like reproductive inhibition or reproductive investment. We actually have very little empirical support for that. So I want to return to this. Sex is costly, energetically, especially for females. We expect if there's going to be any effect of GCs on behavior, this might be where we find it, where they're already on their energetic budget extreme point. Females are in a very tenuous position. Uh, they are probably going to mate once this year, and this might be her one and only mating opportunity in her life. This might be her entire lifetime fitness. Right? So she had better not fuck this up. 
and she's got a choice to make. Sometimes that choice is easy. The attractive male is also the nearby male. That's an easy call. Uh, she can make that choice and invest very little locomotor effort and gain the rewards from doing that. If on the other hand, she chooses uh, to pursue the more attractive mate that happens to be further away, that's gonna incur some cost. And specifically, it's going to incur some direct costs for her. Locomotor costs, increased predation risk, and lost opportunity. So there's direct benefits reasons for her to be scrupulous and choosy and to modulate her preference, i.e. her choosiness, as a function of the real world constraints and conditions. Okay, and this matters not just for direct benefits reasons, but also indirect benefits reasons. In this species we know this is really one of the only species where we have good genes evidence uh, for sexy sons, that females that choose to mate with males that produce sexier calls give rise in sire males that have sexier calls themselves. So let's turn to the main question. Do elevated GCs impact mate choice in frogs? I wanna ask the question whether or not females with higher GCs, experimentally higher, are more or less motivated, uh, more or less choosy, and whether their preferences change as well. So there are really two and only two studies that have kind of examined this question in the past. In 2001, a mouse study uh, looked at um, court in females by uh, injecting them and then asking whether or not court injected females had a reduced interest in a male odorant compared to a blank odorant. Uh, and that um, result, the result there was showing um, that indeed the interest in the male odorant does go down. This doesn't allow us to look at preferences. Uh, a male signal compared to a blank doesn't evaluate preferences or choosiness. So there's some limited inference with that study. Um, a more recent study by Chris Leary uh, out of his lab in 2015 showed that female tree frogs treated with court have weakened natural preferences for faster male call rate. So this suggests that court is eroding the species typical preference. There's some issues with this study as well in terms of stimulus control. This was done in the field and um, very high levels of court were used uh, in order to elevate circulating court. So these two studies sort of set the stage for us to look at this in more detail. This is the study design. I'm gonna walk through this. Um, I wanna point out here that it is a within subjects design, both within and between subjects design. And by looking at the pre versus the post injection time point, we can look at change in proceptivity preferences and choosiness. So let me begin, we go to the field. Um, this work was done in the uh, in seven uh, lakes around the Twin Cities in Minnesota, uh, where we go out at night and we collect reproductive pairs that haven't yet oviposited. And while I'm on this slide, I wanna just um, give a shout out to the 14 undergrads over the years that participated. Uh, between 2014 and 2017, we did a whole battery of pilot studies and validations to get this project off the ground. And then in 2018, I had three students join me for the original study. In 2019, I took three students back to Minnesota to replicate that original study. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, two collaborators, Mark B at the University of Minnesota and Megan Gall at Vassar College, funding from Swarthmore and NSF. Okay, so the first thing we do is we bring them back to the lab and we hold these frogs, these pairs, overnight at four degrees Celsius. Uh, this is a procedure that we've used for a long time. We validated in 2017 that this procedure doesn't impact phonotaxis behavior, mate choice, or plasma circulating GC levels. Uh, after the overnight hold, the animals are randomly assigned to one of five treatment groups, a no inject, a vehicle inject, and then low, medium, and high cork concentrations. Um, in between 2014 and 18, we did a lot of work to validate um, a lot of what you're seeing here. The dosages, the vehicle, the solvent, the timelines, the route of administration, and then all the endocrine aspects in the lab. We wanted to achieve physiologically stepped levels of plasma cork 
without interfering with behavior per se. We didn't want the injection to affect behavior, et cetera. And so I'll come back to that. Okay, after um, being held for um, overnight and randomly assigned to a treatment group, we warm them up to 20 degrees Celsius with their mate. They get back into amplexus within seconds or minutes. And after 30 minutes of a hold, they start their battery of behavioral testing. So I wanna walk through this carefully. The first test, which I'll refer to as the static test, is just a typical two choice test. In this case, we give females a very big stimulus contrast, a 22 pulse call versus a 38 pulse call. Okay, and so that is two standard deviations below the average call length and two standard deviations above. This is an easy contrast for the females. I'm gonna play those two calls for you now. Here's the 22 pulse and the 38 pulse. Again, this is pre-treatment, so we're getting some baseline proceptivity and baseline preferences here by looking at response rates and then which one they choose. After that static test, um, we also do a series of four dynamic tests, two of which are controls. So these are very much like the static test. In this case, um, they're gonna be slightly less easy contrast for the female. So two standard deviations below the average call versus the average call, that's 22 versus 30. And then um, the average call, 30 pulses versus two standard deviations above the average, 38 pulses. These are control tests, so there's, there's nothing happening um, that's dynamic in this test, uh, but I'll explain uh, what the dynamic tests are in contrast so you can understand. Using those same stimulus contrasts, we're gonna do a series of dynamic tests, and this is what we're gonna be using for evaluating uh, choosing this. We're gonna introduce an energetic trade-off here. Um, so let me explain what that looks like. Here, what you're doing, you're looking down um, from the top at the behavioral arena inside the acoustic chamber. Female is positioned in that center point, the origin, and on her left and on her right are speakers. S 10 centimeters around the speakers are the choice zone. She enters that, we count it as a choice. And then um, a semicircle about halfway between the origin and the speaker um, outlines the approach boundary. The approach boundary is what allows us to automatically manipulate the playback of the calls in real time as the female is approaching. And so what you have in this slide here is a female who has a low pulse number call on the left and a high pulse number call on the right. She must initially approach that higher pulse number call, which she almost unanimously will do. That's a prerequisite. But the moment she crosses that approach boundary, the signals are gonna be automatically changed. The speaker in front of her is still going to be the male over on the right, but he has suddenly become less attractive. He's no longer a 38 pulse call, he's a 30 pulse call male. And vice versa, behind her on the left. Okay, so this is actually quite normal. Males are changing their pulse number uh, throughout the night uh, rapidly. This is a condition that females face in the real world at the LEC. Okay, so the moment she crosses that boundary uh, seamlessly in between call, interleaved calls, um, a script uh, runs in the background and adds eight pulses to the approach, to the unapproached call and deletes eight pulses from the approached call. And the question is, what does she do? Does she keep going and make a non-reversal choice, selecting the lower attractive, the less attractive male, but saving some energy? Or does she reverse and incur a, an energetic cost uh, in an effort to mate with the more attractive male? How does she resolve that trade-off? Let me show you a, uh, a live video of two trials. This is, these are both dynamic experimental trials. The first one, female number 322, making a non-reversal choice in the 30 versus 38 contrast. You can see these, this is not sped up. These trials tend to be pretty quick. She's out of the gate. She crosses over that decision boundary, pauses for two seconds, and then completes her choice. So there's a non-reversal choice. So here's the same female exhibiting a reversal choice in the other stimulus condition, 22 
versus 30. Almost identical pause duration after the stimulus manipulation. That ends up being representative. I'll come back to that. And this also ends up being representative, more likely to see reversals in the 22 versus 30 contrast compared to the 30, 38. And I'll come back to why that is. So she executes the rest of her choice. Okay, so that's a reversal and non-reversal. Then we give an injection uh, to the female or no inject in the case of the, that treatment group. What I want to just tell you briefly about that is that we, we matched our, we hit our target with this, as I explained earlier, the no inject and vehicle inject females have uh, identical, virtually identical plasma cork. Um, and then that cork in the plasma um, increases uh, in a stepwise function. The no inject and vehicle inject are at the physiological average for a breeding female on the night she makes a choice. And the upper limit of the high cork gets us to the natural range limit for unmanipulated females collected in the field on the night that they breed. Okay, so really what we wanna do is compare the change in behavior before compared to after treatment. So let's start with um, proceptivity. The predictions here uh, are the following. The alternative prediction here is that as cord increases in the blood, we'll see a diminished mate choice response. And the background there that you need to understand is that for a long time, we consider the HPA axis as antagonistic to the sex steroid axis or HPG axis. So in theory, higher cork should diminish sexual behavior. It should inhibit it, All right? So this is kind of the standing standard alternative hypothesis here. And the inference would be that cork suppresses sexual motivation we should see some kind of stepwise function. Um, the null hypothesis, of course, is, is no effect. Uh, and the inference, if we found that, would be that sexual motivation appears to be buffered from elevated GCs, perhaps because of elevated HPG products like estrogen. The results are very consistent with the null hypothesis. Court has no major effects on sexual proceptivity. In fact, 100% of females made mate choices in every single trial after treatment, which was nominally higher than their um, responsiveness before treatment. We replicated this null result uh, across all three acoustic conditions, the static tests and the two control dynamic tests, and across two years of, of testing, the original study and the replication study. So it does appear that sexual motivation is buffered from high elevated GCs. We also found that there was no minor effects of court on sexual proceptivity. There were no changes in latencies or a variety of other behaviors that we measure in real time uh, with the tracking. So it appears that there really is, is no effect whatsoever of court on sex drive in females. Everything we've looked at points directly to that result. How about preferences? We can look at preferences in the control trials and the static trials. We just ask, do they decrease their preference strength for the longer call with elevated court? And that would be the alternative, the standard alternative hypothesis. This is really driven by that study by Davis and Leary that I introduced before. It's really all we have to go on here. The inference would be, if that were the case, that court appears to interfere with sensory tuning or perhaps sensory motor integration something in the midbrain. The null hypothesis of no effect would look something like this and would indicate that sensory and or sensory motor centers are again buffered against elevated GCs. Like with proceptivity, we find that court has no major effects on sexual preferences. The longer call is chosen before and after court treatment. Again, nominally higher after court treatment. Not significantly, but nominally higher after. Uh, indicating that uh, sensory and sensory motor centers appear to be buffered against high GCs, at least for this timeline. We replicated this null result across the acoustic conditions as well as two years of testing. We also found that there are no minor effects of court on sexual preferences. Females approach initially 
longer calls both before and after cord treatment. Again, we replicated this as well. So it does appear that preferences are very stable. They're robust. And even the highest concentrations of manipulated cord do nothing to interfere with those preferences. Okay, those two chapters of the study were really important. Uh, there's really actually not that much known uh, in any system about how experimentally changed court levels affect sexual motivation and preferences. But the real goal with this study was to look at choosiness. This was the uh, untouched um, territory. And in my view, the area where if we were going to expect any effect, this is where we would find it, where we contrive an energetic trade-off directly into the experimental design. So let me tell you the predictions, okay? Before and after um, injection, the control trials where the stimuli are not manipulated should be somewhere around 0% reversal and uniform across the treatment groups. And that's exactly what we found. Um, less than 1% reversal overall before and after treatment. Uh, this indicates that we have a low false positive rate. Females are not changing their mind um, haphazardly and for no reason. Uh, when they initially approach a call, they intend very much to complete that mate choice in that direction, assuming nothing else changes. Okay, how about in the experimental trials where we are changing the stimuli in real time? Well, before injection, all 107 frogs here are created equal. They were randomly assigned to treatment groups, but they have not been injected yet. So they should have roughly equal reversal rates. And the way we titrated this behavioral um, stimulus contrast out with the pilot studies, um, physician does to expect around a 30% reversal rate before treatment. And that's about what we found. In the 22 versus 30 contrast, we found a 39% reversal rate and no significant difference among treatment groups. In the 30 versus 38, we found a 17% reversal rate with no significant difference among treatment groups, indicating that in both of these contrasts, we don't have any sampling error. We, uh, we lucked out with the random assignment. Okay, and we also achieved our, our criterion um, target of around 30% reversals. Okay, how about after injection? Well, the null hypothesis here is that court has no effect across treatment groups, but that it diminishes reversal rate and does so evenly across treatment groups. And the reason that's a prior prediction here is that we've shown in a variety of frog species that just the march of time is going to decrease choosiness in females as that oviposition window forecloses. Okay, and the alternative prediction, the one that you know, we're especially interested in here, is that reversal rates show an inverted U dose response curve, whereby moderate GC elevations enhance choosiness, i.e. trade-off locomotor costs for the more attractive mate, and the low and high GCs suppress it. And that's what we see in the 22 versus 30 contrast. We see decreases across the board in reversal rates in all treatment groups, except for the medium court group, which goes up. Uh, substantially from 32% to 52%. A similar result um, was found in the 30 versus 38. We see uh, a increase from 10% to 40% in the moderate group and then decreases or no change in the low and high treatment group. So that looks like support. Uh, if we put those two treatment groups together, so we collapse across the two stimulus contrasts, we can uh, interrogate a few things that we need to look at here. Number one, this is very interesting, but does injection or does the act of, of aging during the uh, inter um, time interval here affect reversal rates? And the no inject group tells us it does not. Just getting an hour older does not change reversal likelihood in the species. So that's a good thing. Secondly, the vehicle group allows us to ask whether injection per se has an effect on reversals. There is a nominal decrease in reversals after injection, but it's, it's nowhere close to significant. So it looks like injection per se doesn't have an effect. So we can really evaluate those low, medium, and high effects directly with respect to the court change 
induced in their plasma. If we compare 22 versus 30, 38, um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because uh, it's really a topic for another conversation, but what you see across the board is reversal rates are higher in that 22-30 contrast compared to 30-38 uh, before and after injection. And that's what we predicted. And that's uh, an outcome from psychophysics based on Weber's law, uh, which indicates that the proportion uh, of difference between two stimuli is what really matters, not their absolute difference. These two stimuli contrasts differ in absolute terms by eight pulses each, but the 22 versus 30 is proportionally a bigger contrast, and therefore you see a larger choosiness coefficient attached to it. That's all I want to say about that. I come back to our major result here. We see a significant elevation in the moderate court group and decreases in the low and high. Um, the model um, derived from this, the generalized linear mixed model, looking at the interaction term time point and treatment, um, confirms that this effect is significant. So this is the within and between subjects analysis. And we're collapsing across the two acoustic conditions here and both years. Uh, but we replicated this result in 2018 or 2019 after originally finding it in 2018. And you can see that result here, that moderate court group um, after injection sees a significant elevation in uh, reversal probability and there's no change or small decreases in reversal probability for the other four treatment groups. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, a female that reverses incurs a 77% increase in her time commitment. That's significant. So there's a time cost to choosiness and we also validated a locomotor cost. There's a roughly doubling of locomotor effort uh, by reversal. So this, this is uh, maybe only three meters, um, doesn't seem like a lot, but for these little frogs that are four centimeters long, this is um, football fields worth of, of locomotor effort. This is more than 80 body lengths. Um, the last point I want to make about the behavior is that if we look at the pause durations that happen immediately after the stimulus manipulation as a window into whether or not females are even aware that the stimuli have changed, it appears quite strongly to be the case that um, that doesn't distinguish or discriminate anything. Females appear to be aware that there's a stimulus change and they continue on their course or they reverse um, despite uh, that awareness. So it does appear from the pause, da pause duration data that this is really a decisional process, not an attentional process that's happening here. Okay, so I want to wrap up. Um, I introduced the, the idea of hormone pleiotropy. The single steroid like CORT can have diverse effects. That CORT regulates glucose prioritization, resolving, helping to resolve energetic trade-offs. That sex is all about energy, which is all about glucose, which is all about glucocorticoids. Right? Uh, CORT levels are naturally elevated during the breeding season, especially on the day of breeding and that experimentally elevated court doesn't suppress sexual motivation and it doesn't change sexual preferences, which indicates in my mind that we're probably not seeing effects in the auditory midbrain in some hypothalamic regions. It must be the case at some level that these parts of the brain are buffered against these elevated GCs, at least for this time course. We will know more. I've got all these brains sitting in a minus 80 and we're uh, busy doing qPCR for MR and GR throughout the brain and we've got the plasma samples to evaluate as well. So we're going to hopefully have some insight into this question. And then um, what I spent most of my time on was talking about this dynamic meat choice assay where we introduce an energetic cost and there and only there do we see that moderately elevated court enhances sexual choosiness in females. Females more likely to choose the more attractive mate despite the locomotor trade-off. And so this really indicates in my mind that what we're looking at here is a cognitive level effect and it points to some centers in the brain, uh, especially limbic, um, the uh, diencephalon, uh, diencephalon areas, uh, including the social behavior network. We want to know why 
at moderate doses, we're seeing this stimulatory effect, whereas something approaching suppressive effects at low and high doses. So again, we'll have the brains uh, and hopefully we'll get some insight into that. And with that, I'll end with um, the, the future, I think, as I see it, for this line of research, which is it's really time for a, within a single research system to evaluate how the HPA axis and the HPG axis interact in vivo in awake behaving animals. Um, there's clearly some buffering happening. I suspect that part of the buffering has to do with exceptionally high levels of estradiol during peak reproductive uh, competence in females. And that uh, estradiol is um, affecting the, the buffering to the HPA axis products. So I'll end with uh, what I think the take home message is, sex is definitely stressy. Stress can be sexy. It's complicated. It's not linear. And with that, I'll take your questions. I, I know how thorny these issues are and this terminology is. Um, but when, when one is making a distinction between a cognitive effect and maybe what might be interpreted as a motivational effect, how, how can we distinguish amongst those? For example, um, in, in your final results at moderate levels of, of um, manipulation, you are more likely to, to reverse the decision yeah, tell, I'm just make sure, making sure I've got this right, right. Uh, which could be ascribed to uh, an enhanced cognitive process that, that you are distinguishing. But couldn't it also be that at all levels you are distinguishing, but just not acting on that distinction? So how, how do you sort of separate the, the process of distinction from the process of action? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> because all we have is behavior, right? And um, one of the challenges, I mean, you've hit on, a, on an important point, which uh, points to a constraint and a limitation of this, um, of this species and, and in general, a neuron amphibians as model systems for evaluating behavior and decision making, is that we can't separate out um, at some level motivation from uh, other levels of decision uh, because what we can't do is, for example, and no one so far has been successful at this, is have an operant conditioning paradigm, for example, right? We are looking at decision-making behavior, and I think the choosiness dynamic make-choice assay gives us uh, a handhold on it in a way that a, a static make-choice assay doesn't, but at the end of the day, the female has to be reproductively motivated. She will exhibit zero behavior. She will literally not move if she's not reproductively motivated. So there's a threshold level of reproductive motivation that has to be there, right? And then we're, we're sort of subservient to that fact. Um, if that weren't the case, um, and this, this is the case for other systems, we could in theory do a training regime that would allow us to dissociate reproductive motivation from say uh, expressions of preference. Um, but they're really united in a way that is, um, uh, I think, di un disentanglable, if you will, uh, here. That said, um, your original point about cognitive, I mean, that's a, it's definitely a sticky wicket. Um, I'm kind of distinguishing decision making at a cognitive level here from, say, just attentional mechanisms mm -hmm. um, or very basic motivational mechanisms. I think in both cases, the motivational Mechanisms are clearly there, right, in all treatment groups before and after treatment. There really doesn't appear to be a change in whether or not the animal is responsive. And likewise, with the preference um, and with attention, there doesn't appear to be any indicator behaviorally that what we're looking at is reversal females are those that were aware there was a change, and non-reversal females have no idea. That doesn't appear to be the case either. So that, therein lies the distinction for me. Um, I, I use the word cognitive, though, with some trepidation because it does come with uh, certain assumptions baked in. Is there any value in looking at path linearity or duration of pauses or some metric of information integration, or is there just 
not not the sort of scope there to to differentiate well yeah so i've done kind of a, a basic analysis on a lot of the behavioral these are all um uh video recorded and then um tracked uh trials um using ethovision so um so we have a lot of data so you know there's a lot of data in in this experiment i've evaluated kind of the the principal things that I've been interested in, but you could easily expand that to really look at, say, how changes in instantaneous velocity, gate mode, and pausing uh, changes as a function of, of uh, approach, as well as as a function of treatment group and, and time point. Um, and if I find a, a student that's interested in, in diving into the big data set to do that, I think it would be a fun follow up study. Um, it's again, I think on the on the margins, it's minor effects, uh, but I think it would potentially be useful in terms of being a bit more precise with our inferences. Great. Hi. Yeah. Hi, Alex. Uh, this is Harold from Psychology Speaking. I really loved your talk. I could have kept listening uh, just on. It was a great talk. I have a, a simple or a, a question for you because you mentioned that the future is in studying the interaction of those two hormone systems. And you also mentioned that positive and negative valence was leading to a similar cortisol response. My question now would be does it matter how you bring up? the cortisol response. Mm. Can you generalize by injecting it out of context that it has the same effect independent on whether you get a high with positive valence or negative valence? If you could comment on this, it would be wonderful. Thank you. I'd love to. Thanks for the question. That's a, a question that I've spent a fair bit of time thinking about, actually. Um, my my the, the short answer is I think it does matter. I think the time course matters quite a bit. I mean, what we're looking at is a genomic integration effect here. And whether that is exponential in increase for court versus uh, more linear probably matters. Um, I don't have any data in this species that speaks to that, but I can tell you from uh, work that I've done in birds, uh, that onset speed appears to really matter quite a bit. Um, and in fact, uh, the rate of court onset with a standardized stressor, and this is natural court onset um, in the plasma, so no experimental manipulation there, um, nicely differentiates um, individuals and it's heritable. And it's linked with other behavioral phenotypic levels, including exploratory behavior. And so we showed in some work that I did as a, a postdoc here and at the Netherlands Institute for Ecology that that heritable variation in um, court temporal dynamics, if you will, uh, is a genetic correlation and that it has implications for how animals cope with future stressors. Um, and so, yeah, I think that it probably does. I mean, we're clearly, um, you know, con contriving a uh, experimental model here by doing injections and they're getting a bolus of court dissolved in sesame oil, um, which is getting into circulation quickly, right? And sort of reaching its peak around 30 to 60 minutes later, which is why we do the testing 30 to 60 minutes later. Um, these are all um, points in the design here that, that were very intentionally calibrated. Um, and so, yeah, I think it probably matters how quickly that goes up. Uh, it is at the end of the day, a area under the curve uh, function. We're really looking at cumulative court signaling, not the concentration at any moment in time. So you just change the elevation of that initial slope and you really quite dramatically change the area under the curve. Um, we know that higher onset speeds are uh, typically associated with faster offset speeds. It's another genetic correlation. Um, and so that actually would indicate that a higher onset speed, generally speaking, is going to be associated with less area under the curve and lower court overall. But um, that's, that's in a whole different system. Um, so yeah, I think that that probably matters and it would be great to have a way of introducing experimentally court in a sustained pulsatile way. I mean, that's the other feature here that's fully non-physiologically relevant, right? Um, 
this is a system that has a pulsatile rhythm to it. Even during a natural core spike, there's still going to be a little ultradian pattern on top of that. Uh, and we ablate that when we do injections, right? And if we had a way to deliver via some kind of vehicle uh, in the organism, the, the pulsatile nature, uh, we would do that. And that's certainly um, the, the holy grail in many ways experimentally.